San Francisco. Just hanging out of his street car on our way back from dinner. We're headed up California Street, that's it behind me. Almost to the top of the hill. We're here for a couple days after uh, a couple days in Napa. We had some sushi for dinner and we're headed back to the hotel. Winery, which is high up in the hills, uh, and I guess northern Napa. It's gorgeous. Napa County is about an hour and a half north of San Francisco and makes for a great addition to any San Francisco itinerary. There are a number of ways to get there from the airport, including bus shuttles and car rentals. We decided against renting a car for two reasons. One, the point of going to Napa is to drink, and two, Ubers and Lyfts are plentiful. But instead of sitting on a bus for 90 minutes, we took the ferry from the city up San Francisco Bay to Vallejo, where we took a lift the rest of the way. Napa the town is actually somewhat uninspiring. Outside of the name and a cute food hall, there isn't much to see. We based ourselves in Yauntville, which is about 10 miles away, connected by a road, rail, or running trail. What's the name of the trail you're running on? The Napa Valley Wine Trail. There's a little bit of wine, a lot of trail. The charming little town of Yonville is probably most famous for being the home of Thomas Keller's French Laundry. For those of you who can't get reservations, like us, there are a number of other great restaurants to choose from, including a few others from Thomas Keller, like Ad Hoc and Bouchard. Every Napa itinerary includes wine tastings, and you should really plan at least one full day to do it. While there are numerous companies that offer tours, as well as plenty of drivers for hire, we decided to make our own schedule and rely on Ubers and Lyfts to get around the valley. Regardless of how you see the wineries, figure you'll get to about three or four within the course of one day. Our first stop is Alpha Omega Winery. Alpha Omega was about 10 minutes from our hotel. It had a beautifully situated outdoor tasting area, fairly steep tasting fees, and doesn't require but does recommend making reservations. Like all the wineries we visited, everything is quite tasty. It was a great introduction to Napa. Our second stop is the Satui, uh, which is a great stop around lunchtime because they have a nice little Italian marketplace. Uh, or you can do a little picnic. And we we are having lunch at Satui Winery. A little picnic. Nikki, would you like to tell us what we're having? Uh, we're having some quinoa salad, prosciutto, olive tapenade, and some fresh bouchon bread. Delicious. It's a beautiful day out here in Napa. It sure is. <laughs> it always is. It always is. Our third stop was high in the hills at Cade Winery. The amazing views here pair well with the uber expensive tasting fees. The winery is LEED gold certified, constructed with lots of reclaimed material, and aesthetically pleasing from the tasting room to the wine cellar. Our final stop was Fela, a much more low key winery where we saw harvest season in full swing and did a tasting in their cave. just did a wine tasting at Vela. It was delicious. And it was complimentary thanks to Christina and Dan 
Thanks! If you're totally exhausted after a day of wine tastings, Napa offers numerous ways to help you relax, some more unique than others. We're in Calistoga and we're at the Golden Haven Hot Springs where we're about to uh, take a mud bath because that's what you're supposed to do here. It's a, a mud bath in volcanic ash, which is uh, pretty much all the soil in Calistoga. Suspended in mud. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like zero gravity. 100% mud, zero gravity. All right, here's the tubs, there's the shower, and there's the jacuzzi. <laughs> Great. On our way back to San Francisco, we took the ferry again. The best part about taking the ferry, other than the views, is that the boats arrive and depart from San Francisco's revitalized ferry terminal which does double duty as a transportation hub and one of the city's premier foodie destinations. We're at the famous ferry terminal in San Francisco, and we're about to eat some Hog Island oysters. They are by no means the most efficient method of transportation, but depending on where you're staying in the city, San Francisco's iconic cable cars can be a reliable way to get up and down some of the most imposing hills you'll ever see in a city. From a stop just a couple blocks from the ferry terminal, a cable car whisked us up Knob Hill to the Fairmont Hotel, a San Francisco landmark and more than adequate home base. This is our room at the Fairmont. This is the balcony. Which we had quite the view. Out there is San Francisco Bay. And here we are overlooking a little garden. And the water in the distance downtown San Francisco. The Fairmont Hotel sits at the nexus of all three of San Francisco's remaining cable car lines, and the neighborhood it's in, Knob Hill, is one of San Francisco's most elegant and centrally located, at least from a sightseeing perspective. The first morning in San Francisco, we walked the trendy Polk Street for some coffee at St. Frank and brunch at the famous Swan Oyster Depot, a favorite of the late Anthony Bourdain. We just had brunch at Swan Oyster Depot. We had Sicilian sashimi, uh, crab back, which is just like the fat of the crab and you dip the bread in it. We had uh, like cracked crab and clam chowder and uh, sat next to some friendly folks. <laughs> Swan Oyster Depot is a cash-only, lunch-counter-seating seafood throwback where you can expect to wait at least 45 minutes to get in. In our opinion, it's totally worth it. Also, go early when they open for the shortest lines. We only waited 15 minutes on a Saturday morning. Chinatown is one of San Francisco's oldest and most famous neighborhoods, and one that's on nearly every tourist must-see list. It's one of several very unique and very different neighborhoods that make up this city. We'd say that the best way to truly see San Francisco is to explore and eat your way through each one of them. If you're looking for distant views of the Golden Gate Bridge or gigantic hordes of Taurus, head down to Fisherman's Wharf. Once the home base of actual fishermen, today it's home to souvenir shops and the city's most famous residents, sea lions who showed up in 1989 and never left. Once you're done watching them bark at each other, hop on a cable car and go to a more interesting neighborhood. Perhaps watching all those sea lions got you in the mood for seafood. In that case, you better head to Japantown, which is low on sights but big on sushi. We found the small mom and pop run Kiss Seafood. We may have been in San Francisco, but there were no California rolls here. For an equally delicious meal in a neighborhood with a bit more color, 
head over to the mural lined streets of San Francisco's Mission District. Every local you speak with has a different recommendation for the city's best burrito. After careful consideration, we went to El Ferrolito and were not disappointed. As an added plus, El Ferrolito owns the bar next door too, which means more seats, more beer, and more locals. On our final morning in San Francisco, we went to the SF MoMA, which is one of the world's premier modern art museums. It's a good place to digest a morning burrito while you ponder what exactly all this stuff is supposed to be. The creepy spiders mean our trip to San Francisco is over. Here's one last nighttime shot of the skyline before we spin on out of here.